So I'm Yogetsu, and uh, I'd like to just share some thoughts with you today about uh, everyday bodhisattvas. It's got to be one of my absolute favorite topics. Uh, I love the idea of a bodhisattva. And I love the idea of an everyday bodhisattva. Because I must admit, way back when, uh, early on in my practice, um, I gave a lot more lofty credit to this idea of a bodhisattva. And it, and it sort of got tangled up for me a little bit with pride, with specialness, with feeling um, apart from. Um, so as I've learned to work with that, uh, the notion of everyday bodhisattvas feels um, so right because it invites all of us into this place of working together, loving each other, um, loving ourselves. Um, so for me, the, the notion of everyday bodhisattvas just really hits the nail on the head. You know, we can walk around town, we can go to work, we can come in here, we can be with our families, with our, our you know, spouses, our partners, and we are bodhisattvas. So um, it was a painful learning process for me because there's something about being special that feels good, <laughs> doesn't it? I mean, there's something about being, you know, extraordinary. I, I struggled a lot with the whole ordinary, extraordinary uh, dichotomy and uh, learned that it's just not helpful <laughs> to feel extraordinary, to feel special. It, uh, what I found more than anything is that it really separates me from others in a way that's not kind or that's not helpful. Holding nothing back and making a promise in our hearts to share in the suffering of others. That's what becoming a bodhisattva is. It's simple. So I like this word simple. I tried to make my spiritual practice anything but early on. It felt good that it was complicated because it felt special. It felt extraordinary. And I realized I needed simple because complicating it uh, wasn't useful. So when I read this, Trump was quote, thank you, Carol. It's just putting others first. It's simple, and we are just like Buddha. I thought, this is perfect. These are really extraordinary instructions, or ordinary instructions, maybe. So Trungpa goes on to say, we acknowledge that we're not going to be further instigators of chaos. <laughs> I love this. Because we, we kind of like chaos. I, I like chaos a little bit. Because then we can feel important. We can feel like, oh, I can do something about it. I know how to step in there, and I know how to make some, some adjustments to this chaotic work thing or my family life. But Trunk was saying, no, no, acknowledge we're not going to be instigators of chaos. But we're going to become liberators of self and others. You know, that's, I love the image of Manjushri, because Manjushri, Bodhisattva Manjushri, you know, um, holds the sword that cuts through dualism, that cuts through, you know, you, you and I. It's cutting through the separateness. But it's a sword, isn't it? And I, and I like to imagine holding this sword and becoming the liberator. You know, bodhisattvas are, are liberators, are, are heroic. Shantideva often equates bodhisattvas with spiritual heroes. You know, maybe we shy away from that word, but it really is. There's something heroic about turning towards suffering, turning towards fear, turning towards pain, and acknowledging it, maybe observing it. You know, it's not unlike our three tenets of a peacemaker. You know, being with it, observing it, and bearing witness so that a loving action can arise. But just to kind of go back to your story, the beginning was about uh, your 
have struggled with extraordinary toughness. Yeah. So here again, you are bringing this term in, but it's a little bit contradictory to simple in my mind. Mm. So I, I and I'm and maybe I'm just also uh, struggling with hero, the kind of term, because mm. it's a, the Western term of hero, right. kind of my my starting place. But I, I'm curious, like so. On one hand, you're saying it's simple, and you, and on the other hand, it's ordinary, and the other hand, it's also extraordinary. So I'm a little confused. Um, yeah. You know about that, if, and maybe I'm maybe they're both the same. I'm not sure. So. Thus the paradox, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's ever clear until we've realized emptiness. But um, no, that's a good point, Carol. I think that's a really good point that I feel like. What Shantideva, and I'll go into that in, in a minute, what Shantideva um, also encourages us is to think about the multitude of teachings that we're given. So not everything is going to resonate for each of us. Maybe hero is a little off-putting right now. Maybe for someone else, hero means, yes, I've got the cape. Here I go. <laughs> But, but Shantideva is saying that, you know, that's why there are 84,000 different teachings because we, we might respond to a different remedy. Maybe there's a different teaching that opens our heart, that opens our mind. And if we discover that it's maybe a certain word or teaching or phrase doesn't do it, then it doesn't do it right now. But we still remain open to it. Like, okay, right now that's not working for me. But, you know, I'm not going to disavow it. You know, we, we let there be some opening for it. So Shanti Deva says, let me tell you a little bit about Shanti Deva because he's a really interesting guy. Um, so he was an 8th century Indian Buddhist monk. Who, who had a job with a king. I'm not quite sure why it didn't work out. <laughs> but he had a job working for a king, and it didn't work out. So he kind of meandered over to N Nalanda Monastery. At that time, it was a monastic university. And uh, came in, and uh, he quickly got a reputation at the monastery. And he, he, the other monks were sort of like disparaging, you know, like sort of bullying a little bit. And they... They called him, I don't know how, how it, it's said in Tibetan or Sanskrit, but it's sort of like the three things. They accused him of only eating, sleeping, and pooping. <laughs> so that was, his, that was his nickname. The guy that eats, sleeps, and poops. Doesn't come to Sashin. Doesn't do ritual. The guy eats, sleeps, and poops. What on earth? How could he be doing anything of value? So at one point, as the story goes, um, and Shantideva, by the way, means peace god, which I think is really cool. So as the story goes, there was a point in the monastery where exams were happening. And one of the ways that monks would, uh, would sort of prove their uh, uh, wisdom or knowledge would either be by reciting something that they memorized or expounding on something in Dharma. So Shantideva's cohorts decided to place the throne really high so that when he would walk into the meditation hall, you know, they were trying to embarrass him because all he did was eat, sleep, and poop. What does he know? He's not going to know anything. So Shantideva comes into the zendo or comes into the meditation hall, immediately flies up to the throne. <laughs> So that probably got some of his uh, fellow monks wondering, like, oh, OK. And he said, do you want me to just talk about something that I've memorized or share something original? And they're like, oh, another place to <laughs> disparage Shantideva. So they said, talk about something original. So Shantideva recited, the whole of the Bodhisattva way of life, the Bodhicatta Avataria. And uh, these two books, I don't know if you've ever worked with the, the translations. There's many, many translations of the Bodhisattva way of life as uh, 
developed by Shanti Deva. These are two of my favorite. This this is actually extraordinary. But so Shanti Deva recited it, and then as the story goes, floated further up, joined by Manjushri. So how much more special can you get? <laughs> you know, and his fellow monks are like, well, and but he brought them to states of realization as well. So it wasn't just about showing off. It was about offering this extraordinary teaching um, and being able to help his, uh, his fellow monks. So, um, and I love the stories in Buddhism because sometimes we, we can think, oh, it's so fantastical and how can that be? But, but I really, like I encourage you to try to bring it into, into your own life. Try to find the meaning for what does that story about Shantideva sort of activate for you? How can you use that story in your quest to become a bodhisattva? What does it mean to be in this situation? And, and really bring it home. Bring it into your everyday life because that's what being an everyday bodhisattva is about. We're not just standing in awe or in disbelief at these stories. But rather... Um, we try to become inspired by them, inspired by the, all the practitioners, all the ancestors that have come before that are still a part and, uh, of our heart, of our lineage, of our, of our mental continuums, if you will. So um, bodhisattvas are not overwhelmed by the conditions of the world. Bodhisattvas ask, what can I add to this situation? What can I contribute? Not, what's in it for me? Before I do it, what's in it for me? What am I going to get from it? Because selfish mind wants to know. And um, bodhisattvas are saying, this is a very deep practice. We're, We're never sitting on the cushion alone, for ourselves alone. We're sitting for ourselves and others. You know, and if we think about that, no matter how many people are in the zendo, I like to sometimes do this little visualization before I start a sitting practice and just fill up the room. I just try to imagine the room is filled and then extended outwards and extended outwards. So our action of sitting is very powerful. It's very significant. Whether there's one other person in the zendo Or 50. You know, what Shantideva is saying, it's a very, very deep practice. It's never just for us. Bodhisattva is always thinking, how can I help? What can I do? How can I get closer to others? So the compassion, and, and you've often heard of the two wings of a bird, compassion and wisdom. We need both. So in the Bodhisattva path, too much compassion or just strictly staying with compassion can get to be a little mushy, right? And that's where we can burn out. We can get really tired. because, Or we can have, I think Trungpa uses the term crazy compassion? Idiot compassion. Idiot compassion. You know, or we think... I've just got to extend myself more and more and more. And meanwhile, we feel like we're getting ill or we're tired or something's going on. So I I think it's really important that we understand that when compassion is conjoined with wisdom practices, it gives us sort of this balance point. Too much wisdom, too much um, analysis or focus on emptiness can be very heady. And I used to like that. <laughs> I was drawn to that. Compassion practices, I'm like, ah, get me to the wisdom practices. Isn't that what's going to cut through delusion anyhow and ignorance? Why mess around with everybody's my kind mother and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Until you realize, no, 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 that's not going to work either. But you have to learn from your own experience. That's what Shantideva, that's what all the teachings are telling us. This is... This is personal advice. So whatever arises for us in the way of a teaching, in the way of a teacher, in the way of a sangha, this is our personal advice. This is kind of like, you know, dear Buddha, (laughs) what should I do about my anger? (laughs) 
Um, so we need wisdom and compassion. They've, they've got to be conjoined. Um, and not just any wisdom. There's really a differentiation because it's easy to think, and I thought this, that there's a, there's a certain wisdom if I just read the right book, heard the right teaching, went to the right teacher, I'd get the formula and that would be it. And, so, and I'm not saying we don't need teachers, teachings, formulas, sangha, they're all very, very significant and very important. But the kind of wisdom that Shantideva and, and, and Buddha is talking about is the wisdom that actually cuts through the separateness of me and you. Cuts through our, our nature of non of duality, that there's always this separateness, right? There's always the me and the you. So it's kind of a virtuous wisdom on, on a certain level, that it's the wisdom that goes beyond knowing. It's the wisdom that, um, that's vast, that's clear, that's boundless. So that wisdom, it's also the wisdom, if you think about it very practically, as we're trying to help others, how many times have you tried to help and it's just been an epic fail? <laughs> you said something that you thought, this, this will be helpful. And your friend or family looked at you like, you moron, that was hurtful. Why would you say something like that? And maybe it was the truth. But see, that's compassion without wisdom. We want to help, but it's going to balance us. So we'll know exactly what to do in the moment, what to give, how to be, how to serve um, in a way that's extremely skillful. Because you hear the stories. One of the stories that used to initially disturb me was, you know, Buddha's on this boat with a lot of other sentient beings, and somebody starts to really act up and is really disturbing the peace of others and starts to get so imbalanced that this individual threatens to kill people. So Buddha does the equivalent of throwing him overboard, like, okay, bye-bye. <laughs> and, and initially I thought, what does that mean? That, that feels really unkind. But see, without having wisdom aspect, enlivened in our mind. It's very easy to be judgmental instead of saying, oh, Buddha saved the rest of the boat. <laughs> the guy was a bodhisattva anyhow, so he swam to the other shore faster than the boat, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> Yes, quite true. So, how do we do this? What I tried to do in this first part was to just get you really, really interested in what it means to be a bodhisattva and, and, to, and to really share Buddha's story. Because we're all sharing Buddha's story. Each and every one of us sitting here right now, Buddhist, non-Buddhist, we're sharing in this story with Buddha. So what that means is we have an amazing capacity. Our capacity and potential is amazing. We're amazing people. What Shantideva is saying, connect to this basic goodness in ourselves, and we will connect to the basic goodness in others. We will see more and more of that. So instead of turning away, we will see others as our friends. Even if it's somebody that's bagging groceries at Jewel, we will see them as our friend. We will be interested in smiling. You know, the Tibetans used to have this saying, we should always be on the verge of smiling. <laughs> That's a beautiful thought, isn't it? Because we can be walking down the street, just like in our, you know, we're on the path to nowhere, but we're still there. One of the quotes in Genpo's book said, we're lost, but we're making good time. <laughs> I love that. I love that. 
So we connect with this basic goodness because that opens our heart. Our compassion practices are profound, but they're meant to be self-compassion practices as well. We don't take ourself out of the equation. We work on ourself. We meet our pain, our suffering. We apply the antidotes to ourself. So Shanti Deva is giving us instructions. He's giving us methods. He's giving us tools in the way of the six perfections or the six paramitas. The first five are really methods of getting to wisdom. So they're, they're compassion practices, but they're methods to get to wisdom. Because the sixth, which is wisdom, is really, really the tool. It's Manjushri's sword. We'd all like to hold Manjushri's sword at some point, right? Authentically hold Manjushri's sword. So Shanti Deva is saying the first five perfections or paramitas, and I don't have time to go into those. I know Roshi will be expounding on that later which I encourage you to really, in the Zen Life series, to to listen, because the six paramitas are just exquisite. So the first one's giving, or generosity. And um, in each of the chapters, there's nine chapters. Well, there's ten chapters. The tenth chapter is a dedication chapter. But the first three chapters in A Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life are about helping us to connect to this basic goodness to become interested in learning what it is. Can I do it? Do I want to do it? What are the benefits of doing it? You know, the Tibetans are all about just exhaustive lists. (laughs) Exhaustive. But I find it useful because if we don't really feel like something's going to benefit us or it's of value, we might not spend as much time working on it. So... The first three chapters are about developing the interest in bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment, the mind of awakening. Because there's two aspects of bodhicitta. So we start small. It's baby steps. It's small steps. And Dr. says, we first need the aspiration. Because the aspiration is going to light us on fire. We're going to be interested. So that's one one aspect of bodhicitta. So we learn, like in all of these verses, are really, um, I read one commentary that said Shantideva actually wrote this as instructions to himself, (laughs) as encouragement to himself, to develop his mind, to develop his, his heart. So the verses are, like from time to time, I've loved memorizing them, I've loved putting them on a post-it note, putting them in my calendar, um, whatever I felt like I needed a little nudge on. Um, but the first three chapters are about developing this aspiration that wants to actually go someplace. And then the second type of bodhicitta is engaged, which you're, you're setting out on the journey. It's kind of like the analogy that I, that I like is... Um, If you're interested in having a cup of tea, you're really interested in the tea, but you need the cup, (laughs) right? You're really interested in the tea. That's the engaged bodhicitta. That's the actual path. That's really what you want to drink. But we need the cup. We need the vehicle to get there. We need the aspiration. We need the way. So I think the first three chapters help us do that. It's, it's really just about, you know, he talks about the excellence of bodhicitta. I'm running out of time. I'm only on the second page. I prepared like six pages. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> Two more talks. <laughs> I was like, do I have enough? Is this going to be enough? Are we going to be sitting around looking at each other at 10.30, wondering, is that all there is? <laughs> So here's the, from the first chapter, The Excellence of Bodhicitta. And it's one of my favorite verses. I'll tell a little story about it. So hard to find such ease and wealth, whereby to render meaningful this human birth. If now I fail to turn it to my profit, 
How could such a chance be mine again? So there's also the story of the blind turtle. Do you know about that one? Oh my god. I was fascinated. Oh. It's on the floor. So I had a fascination with turtles growing up. I liked pet turtles. I had turtles in college, and I'd let them swim in the sink in the shared bathrooms, which people weren't too happy about. But I was fascinated by turtles. I just thought they were, I mean, I could see a lot of myself in a turtle. I withdraw into my shell very easily. That's my protection. So when I first heard the story about the blind turtle, it was um, a wake-up call. Because that's what Shanti Dev is trying to do throughout the way of the Bodhisattva. He's shocking us out of our complacency. Because we can get real I can get really comfortable in my complacency. And Shanti Deva wants to shock us out of it because our life is so meaningful. It's precious. It's rare. Don't waste time is what he's saying. So the blind turtle is a story that imagine, if you will, a vast ocean. Vast, as far as the eye can see. And floating on the ocean is this golden yolk. And at the very bottom of the ocean is a turtle, a blind turtle. We're just going to set up a lot of obstacles. (laughs) A blind turtle that only surfaces for air once every 100 years. What are the chances that that turtle is going to surface and put its head through the yoke, the golden yoke of Dharma, on the vast ocean of samsara? What are the chances of that? So when I recognized I had this affinity to turtles, and I thought, well, we've put our head through the yoke. This, we have come through the yoke. That's how, that's how ex- extraordinary. I know I use that word a lot. Sorry, Carol. <laughs> I love the word. I love the word. <laughs> I haven't quite transformed it. <laughs> but what are the odds that we have these conditions? that we have this physical form, that we have teachers, that we have teachings, that we have sangha, the the support of like-minded others. What are the odds that we're alive, that we're here, here, that we have resources? So that's what Shanti Dev is trying to do in the first three chapters, to, to really ignite this wish, to really ignite this aspiration. And then the next several chapters are about um, deepening our bodhicitta, committing to it, committing to our bodhisattva vows, um, and sort of nurturing this seed of bodhicitta. Because Shantideva knows that if we don't attend to something, it will diminish, it will die. Just like a garden, right? If you just went out your backyard and threw some seeds in the ground, you didn't prepare the soil beforehand, you weren't interested in watering it or seeing that it got enough sun, would you expect something to grow? Would you expect a beautiful flower? So the next several chapters, Shantideva is talking about our commitment, how we sort of arise this bodhi mind. And then how do we maintain it? How do we preserve it? How do we support it? And how do we deepen it? So chapters four through eight are about the nurturance of bodhicitta. Chapter nine is the chapter that just is the slam dunk, (laughs) which I don't understand at all. (laughs) I'll be really honest. I'll never give a talk on that. (laughs) Chapter 9 is the wisdom chapter. So Shantideva is saying the first five paramitas, giving moral discipline, patience, effort, concentration or meditation, that's our vehicle. Those are our tools, our instructions, our resources to get us to wisdom. 
to get us to Manjushri's sword so we can cut through the stories that are about separateness, that are about maintaining some illusion, some illusion that what's appearing is, is true. What's appearing is real because it has an impact on us. But it's not true in the sense of true nature, of true reality. So there are so many verses. You could just, you know, flip to some and uh, just be inspired by it. So what Shanti Deva does is not only going through the, the nine chapters in that way, but also weaves in the, the six perfections, the six paramitas. So these are the actual practices that, that we can do. Because in general, the three qualities of a bodhisattva, one, is that we're interested in being generous. And not just eliminating poverty. It's not just about having enough resource. Generosity is, this is what actually motivated me to give it, to say yes to Eve. I found ways to dodge. <laughs> When Sensei asked, when Mark asked, like, oh, not yet. Well, I thought about generosity, and I thought about being generous is also through giving our presence, giving what we can share. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be all knowing, all omniscient. It's just giving what we feel in our heart. It's giving what we share. And for me, the Dharma is. It's so deep. It's giving ourselves to our practice. It's giving our practice for the benefit of others. We're not greedy with our time. We're not greedy with our resources. We're courageous. That's all about being generous, isn't it? The ways that we hold back, Shanti Deva is saying, generosity are the ways that we step forward, that we break through the holding back. The second quality is the quality of, of fearlessness. So it doesn't mean that we don't have fear. I felt a little nervous before I sat down, and I thought, wait a minute. You're not lions on the savannah trying to rip me to, to shreds. <laughs> You're my friends. I'll be OK. <laughs> Calm down. So fearlessness is really a heart of ease, isn't it? It's recognizing fears and being interested in going beyond it. The Heart Sutra is about overcoming, a bodhisattva overcoming all hindrances in the mind attains nirvana. So fearlessness is being able to look at the hindrances in our mind, work with the hindrances in our mind to attain fearlessness, to attain nirvana. And the third quality I don't want to start talking faster. I'm going to just sh shut it off at a certain point because <laughs> I have a tendency to do that. Get it all in. <laughs> Make sure you're satisfied customers. <laughs> and the third quality of a bodhisattva is renunciation. Ooh. When I first heard this word, I thought, give something up? <laughs> what? That sounds hard. <laughs> exactly. I know that was Roshi and Sensei's encouragement. But renunciation in this sense means we realize the first noble truth, which is life is suffering. So again, it's weaving back into life is suffering. There's a way out. Do you want to stay in the suffering or you want to try to get out? You know, it's kind of like sitting in the jail cell with the door open. You ever going to leave? So renunciation is, is feeling that something is not right in our world and for others, that it never ends. So we're trying to look at what's really of value. And Suzuki said, it's not letting go of things but allowing things to let go of us. 
Isn't that beautiful? Not letting go of things, but allowing things to let go of us. So the mind of, renun of renunciation, you know, you can have the big house on the hill and a bank account, and it's the mind that's not attached to it. It's the mind that says, it's not really the true value of my life. It just happens to be appearing right now, and so I'll accept it and use what I can to help others. So it's not attached to it. It's, the, it's, it's a mind of, of, of letting go. And Dogen says, set aside your body and mind, forget about them and throw yourself completely into the house of Buddha. <laughs> Don't you love that? Set aside your body and mind and throw yourself completely into the house of Buddha. Well, you have. You th you, you've thrown yourself completely in here. I mean, we have. This is our house of Buddha. At home is our house of Buddha. Is there any place that's not a house of Buddha, really? With the, with the right attitude, with the right intention. So I'm going to stop here. I, I did have a loftier goal of trying to get through some of, to give you a little bit more of the verses, um, but I would really direct you to these. Uh, this is a translation by Alan Wallace, and this is a translation by the, um, I, I, I never knew who actually translated it, but it's the Padmakara Translation Group. So beautiful translations, very pithy, um, but also quite pointed. There are some that will, you know, like, like the hairs on the back of your neck will stand up because Shanti Devan nails it time and time again, uh, remembering, trying to shock us out of our complacency, trying to get us to move off square one or square two. So last little bit, and I found this just to be uh, so helpful. Because I know sometimes we can feel burdened by the sorrows of the world, the sorrows of our family, the sorrows within our heart. And sometimes we can think, I'm only one person. I only have two hands. Avalokiteshvara has a thousand. And four heads can look in every direction without spinning around, right, a thousand. But if we look at each other right now, I have two hands. You have two hands. Come on, put your hands out. Avalokiteshvara. These are the thousand arms. This is it. These are the thousand arms. All of us. So we don't have to feel discouraged, tired. Or if we do, we talk to our fellow bodhisattvas, to our teachers. We pick up our Dharma books and read something to turn a corner in our heart, in our mind to feel inspired, to feel joyful. So remember, it's about joyfulness. You know, effort in the six paramitas is not, you know, miserable, grind your teeth effort. It's joyful effort because we understand what we're going towards and, and wanting to bring others along with us. So it's, it's joyful. So don't worry. Be happy. <laughs> Thank you. So we just have a couple minutes. Questions, comments? I have a question. Yes. I love that you, on one hand and the other, and thank you, Carol, the words extraordinary, special, uh, there were others. Uh, heroic. Heroic. And ease, basic, simple. And it is the same. Yes. It's the simplicity of Yes. The ease of amazing. Mm. Oh, I like that. But there are two hands working together. Right. And we right. think of superlatives on one hand as difficult to attain, impossible to attain. And on the other hand, we have ease and basic and simple. Mm. But they're rolling. It they is are. the ease of amazement. Beautiful. I love that. So anyone else? Any other comments or questions?
Eve. Yeah, well, it's something I've been struggling with. Um, you know, that when you were saying that when um, you know, when you recognize the connection between yourself and others, that that it's easier to help them. But I, I mean, I think sometimes I, I heard a talk yesterday about protective identification, and oh, yeah, and many other women would say, "Well, sometimes it you know it goes too far the other way." And I have this friend that you know. I, I want to help him with something I did myself, but, and I, I, you know, and I thought, well, I can help him because I went through that, mm. you know, um, and, but I didn't, I've been taking twice as long, and, um, but, um, you know, so I've kind of been stuck there, and, and because of things I've tried to do, so far it doesn't work, but, you know, I, I mean, as you were, were, were talking, I think it was kind of the self-realizations that, that, well, when you were talking about the hands, and I was thinking of skillful means, and and I figure, well, you know, maybe it is about finding some skillful means, mm -hmm. and that, that doesn't mean that, um, and, and that I can still hold to the, the similarities and benefit from the recognition of what the commonalities are, Yes, but, but realize that, you know, I might Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think one of the, you know, one of the practices in, in compassion training and training in compassion according to the Tibetan method is that we, we, we try to um, develop this ground of equanimity, that we're all alike. We look different, we speak differently, we live in different places, we have different, you know, different aspects to our being, but, you know, what's our common thread? We don't want to suffer, and we want to feel happy. That is true for everyone. That is true for animals, isn't it? So I think you're right, Eve. Like trying to settle on the commonalities, trying to to hold uh, someone in mind. Um, you know, a lot of it is a mental state, isn't it? We're cultivating mental states. We're trying to increase our capacity. Uh, we're trying to do this 180 degree. Uh, in raising the Bodhi mind from our usual very self-preoccupied, self-centered state into a very other-centered state. Bodhisattvas are other-centered. Yeah, but so that means sometimes the commonalities may not be what you thought they were. Right, right. Yeah. Right. Or we go back to, you don't want problems, I don't want problems. You want to be happy, I want to be happy. Start there. Okay, I know we're... After time. Thank you. Thank you.